All right, well, this morning we're going to tackle maybe the most famous verse in Philippians, and that is, to live is, but I'm not going to finish it yet. To live is, now here's why I stopped that. Um, Here's a question that has probably been asked millions and millions of times. Some of you have answered the question. Many of you have probably asked the question. The question goes back a number of decades to a guy named Jim Kennedy. James came up with this question that we need to ask ourselves and ask other people. It kind of goes like this. Suppose you were to die tonight and you were to stand before God and he were to say to you, why should I let you into heaven? How would you respond? Now, all of your eternity depends on how you answer that question, but that's not the question I want to ask you today. Here's the question I want you to answer today based on our verse for the morning. Suppose you don't die tonight. Most of us are not going to die tonight, I don't think, right? Suppose you don't die tonight. What are you going to do when you get up tomorrow morning? What are you going to do this afternoon? What are you going to do this week? What are you going to do this month? What are you going to do the remainder of this year? What are you going to do with the rest of your life? You see, we do wrestle with what, what happens when I die. and what's, But how bad if we continue to live? What are you going to live for? Maybe that's a more pertinent question for us this morning. Suppose you don't die tonight. What are you going to live for tomorrow? You see, before we read Paul's answer to the question, why don't we ask ourselves this question? For to me, to live is fill in the blank. Now, you don't give out your answer. You'll embarrass yourself. But honestly, wrestle in your own mind. Um, Here are some of the answers I can tell. I give some of these myself, right? I can look at some of you. No, you. To live is to make money. To live is to get married. To live is to get unmarried. (laughs) To live is to have kids. To live is to get the kids out. To live is to retire early. To live is to accumulate. To live is to build a reputation. To live is to get well. To live is to live in comfort. To live is to travel and see the world. How would you answer the question? For to me, to live is... Now, don't misunderstand me. All those answers that I just gave and that sometimes bubble up in your heart and in my heart, they may not be illegitimate in and of themselves. They become illegitimate when they move to the center and demote Jesus from the central place. You see, Paul says, for to me, to live is Christ. But what happens is those other things begin to invade our lives, they invade our minds, they invade our hearts, and we wind up demoting Jesus. As those things get promoted, Jesus gets demoted, and if you're not careful, those other things may actually choke out Jesus in your life. And you may be living for Another mission completely separate from what he's calling you to live for and you're not recapitulating his mission in your life to the benefit of others. To live is Christ. All right, well, let's read our passage uh, because I don't want to be guilty of what I started with by not uh, looking at the context. If you have your Bibles, your phone, whatever you use, let me read the verses surrounding 121 for me to live as Christ to die is gain. And so we'll remember the context. Remember chapter two, the power plant. So here we go, verse 12. Now, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear through the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. It is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I am in change. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. 
I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I, am no, if I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I'm torn between the two. I desire to, to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. But it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith. So that through my being with you, Again, your boasting in Christ Jesus will abound on account of me. Now, I mentioned a couple of weeks ago that the theme of Philippians, if you're a Bible reader, you know, the theme of Philippians is joy, but there are two sub-themes that lead to the joy. The theme is joy, but you can't have joy without contentment, and you can't have real joy without community. So what Paul says is, it's in community with contentment that you experience joy. Now, you would think since Paul says, to live is Christ, to die is gain, joy is the theme, community and contentment, you would think his circumstances, his situation is really positive. He's in comfort. Life's going well. But we just read that's not true. His situation, his context is suffering. He's in prison, chained to a guard. Think about that. No privacy. Use the restroom. The guard goes with you to the restroom, right? Not only that, he knows he's called and he's wired by God to plant churches. That's, and he's on the sideline. He's been put on the shelf. He can't fulfill his mission. He can't live out what God called him to do. You know, how many people do you know? Um, don't raise your hand. How many people do you know when they retire, they kind of lose their identity and sense of purpose? Well, here's Paul, not retired, put on the shelf, not by his choosing. He didn't choose to retire. He got arrested and thrown in prison. Not just that, he receives the gift from the Philippian church, but the one delivering it almost dies on the way. Epaphroditus, he gets there, Paul has to kind of nurse him back to health. Eventually he lives and he sends him back. That circumstance is full of suffering, isn't it? It's your context too, isn't it? You see, Paul says, I want you to know what's happened to me. And what's happened to him is pain and suffering. And that's your context, isn't it? Maybe not the same exact kind as Paul's, but you know what it's like to live there, right? You live in loneliness, loss of identity, fear, illness. You need a job or want a different job. You don't have enough money. We live with pain and suffering. Now, here's um, an interesting thing about, uh, about our culture. People talk a lot about pain and suffering. You ever notice that? In fact, it's almost um, a badge now to share your pain and suffering. Can you hurt worse than somebody else? And our culture majors on, majors on therapy for suffering. So we go to, and I'm, I'm not the, you know, degrading that in any way. Therapy is good, therapy is good for, but here's what's lacking. We have lots of therapies for suffering, but we lack a theology of suffering. We lack a biblical gospel understanding of suffering, and we don't have time this morning to tease all of that out. Um, I was sitting at my desk this week, I kind of mapped out about 12, th- I'm not going to share all 12 things. I do want to share a couple with you. Here are a couple pillars that you need to have in your head and in your heart. A couple foundational markers in your life that won't ease the pain of suffering, but it'll maybe give you a biblical or more gospel center to it. Suffering cannot be avoided and should not be pursued. Suffering, uh, the required courses of life. You ever notice, though, sometimes in Christian circles, suffering, um, it's it's presented, suffering touches your life because you don't have enough faith. That's a crock. If you have enough faith, you'll be rich. Have enough faith, you'll get well. Have enough, what? That's not biblical. If that's biblical, then Jesus was a failure. It's that biblical. Most of the heroes of the Bible failed. 
Suffering cannot be avoided, but it shouldn't be pursued. You know, crazy, in the early church, there were some Christians who recognized God's method of teaching us often involved suffering and getting things out there. So what they did, they would go out and pursue pain. They would go out and hurt themselves. Well, suffering can't be avoided, and it shouldn't be pursued. Um, no martyr complexes. That, that's not Christian. Now, here's another point. Suffering is not necessarily punishment for sin. Like when you suffer, that doesn't mean, you know, there's a one-to-one correspondence between this pain and suffering and some sin you committed. Now, ultimately, suffering and pain come because our world is cursed by sin, but there's no one-to-one correspondence between a particular sin and your suffering. Maybe at times there is, but usually not. Yeah, how many times did um, the disciples say to Jesus, who sinned, this person or, or their parents? Said, no, 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 you don't understand. You don't understand. It's for God's glory. Here's another one, a the theology of suffering. Pain and suffering can never be used as an excuse for sin or laziness or passivity in your Christian life. How many times do we feel, right? If, if you're in the midst of pain and suffering, God says, well, you don't have to do that. Just live however you want now. Live whatever you can do to make the, make the pain go. That's not true. In fact, I, I sometimes think that pain, and, lousy illustration, sorry. I, I sometimes say, you ever notice before a baseball player goes up to bat, they put that weight on the bat, right? And they practice in the batter's circle. You know what? They never go into the batter's box with the weight on. Um, sometimes it looks like Castellanos does, but usually not right? Um, You know, when you have pain and suffering, that's like swinging the batter's box with the weight on. That doesn't give you an excuse to not do what God wants you to do. That's not an excuse to be passive or lazy in your Christian life. Another point of our theology of suffering, God often uses suffering to show us and grow us. Isn't it true? You learn a whole lot better in the valley than you do on the mountaintop. When God has your full attention through pain and suffering, you learn better, right? You ever notice as you read through the Old Testament, um, I, I think the metaphor is appropriate, even though it physically happened to them. God does some of his best work in deserts. You ever notice that? David runs from Saul in the desert. The Israelites wander through the desert. Jesus, before his ministry, goes, what's a place of desert? A place is, the desert's a place where life is hard. It can't sustain life. You've got to trust in God because death resides. Yeah, it's in deserts that God does his best work. So there's just a couple of things to keep in mind when it comes to suffering. Can't avoid it. Don't pursue it. And recognize, and here, here's what makes the theology work. God often does his best work through pain and suffering. His goal is to make us strong, to make us mature, to make us wise. And if we're always on vacation and life's full of comfort and ease, you're never going to become those things. If you want to become strong, you go through the pain in the gym. You want to get well, you go through the pain of going to a doctor. You want to get smart, you go through the pain of studying and learning. Well, to grow up, you need a little pain. That's God knows that. He built these bodies. Well, that means we've got a whole lot of things in our world to uh, help us grow. I wrote some down. Have you noticed as you get older, your body's running down and wearing out? Uh, Or is it just me? Um, I I saw an Instagram thing the other day that said, it showed a picture or something from maybe the 60s or 70s and said, if you recognize this picture, every joint hurts when you try to get out of bed. I recognize the picture, and I hurt getting out of bed. It's funny how that works, right? Our bodies are wearing out. They're getting old. You ever noticed in our world that every politician is slimy and corrupt? I don't care what's They're all slimy and corrupt, right? Suffering comes from that. Our world is on verge of war. A little suffering, right? Inflation through the roof. Our debt is incalculable. You realize? If you tried to count to what our national debt is, you would die 25 times before you ever got to the finish line. Now, what's our response to that? What's our response to all this stuff? Here's our response. Criticize, critique, and complain. Let me remind you, those are not three gifts of the Spirit. 
What do we do when those things are? Criticize, critique, and complain. I sometimes wonder, those three things should be the motto of lots of churches. Criticize, critique, and complain. That's what we're about. But you know what this verse would tell us? And what the gospel tells us? In the world with that pain and suffering, it's easier to serve people because the needs are so evident. So rather than being passive and critiquing and complaining and criticizing, why not put your work gloves on and boots on and get to work and serve people because the needs are greater? You can give generously in the midst of that. You give by faith, and in the midst of giving by faith, you kind of grow. You can trust God rather than all those other things that we tend to trust. We can create community in the midst of those things that, that are often pulling us apart. So I wrote down, I, I didn't want to leave you on that real down. I'm not done yet, by the way. Um, I wrote down some things that never change, just in case you're getting a, a little confused that we're full of pain. Here's some stuff that never changes. There's still a throne in heaven, and it's occupied. God's never been caught by surprise. He never wrings his hand and says, oh my goodness, what am I going to do? Jesus is still alive. The death of Christ still covers every sin you have and ever will commit. The Holy Spirit still guides and empowers Jesus' people. The gospel still changes life, lives. Love still overcomes bigotry. Jesus is still Lord, and heaven is the destiny of everyone Jesus has died and raised for. That never changes. But the verse doesn't end with something. That's Paul's context, right? And so I don't want you to think Paul's on this gravy train here. He's on big. No, no, no. The context is suffering, but there's transformation involved. Do you notice that? And the transformation comes and everything changes. We actually sang about that today, and that's a major theme of, of the gospel, a major theme of the New Testament, that God loves to take things that are negative. God loves to take pain and suffering and somehow use it to bring our good, good for others, and glory for him. Only God can do that, right? I was going to talk a lot about alchemy now, how God's the ultimate alchemist, but I figured that would take us down the wrong road, so we're not talking about that. Um, but I am going to talk about transformation. So here's Paul. His circumstances are wretched. He's in a prison cell. They try to make it painful. Paul's suffering, chained to a guard. He's put on the bench. His good friend who delivers the support from the church almost died on the way. Everything's falling apart. He's on the bench, and what does he do? He's full of joy. He's experiencing community through Jesus. He's able to live and, and, and without want. The gospel's still, still the center. He's transformed. You ever notice, though? That's often the story of the Bible. So, for example, we, uh, Wayne Gwen and I taught patriarchs this past, um, this past semester. And we ended by, by looking at Joseph for a number of weeks. Now, if you know anything about Joseph, you can already begin to wrestle out how God used really negative circumstances to not just change his life, but to change the whole nation and to bring salvation to the world. Let me just mention a few things. Joseph sold, sold as a slave by his brothers. I know you may want to have done that for your brother. They actually did it. He, he no sooner gets to Egypt as a slave, he's falsely accused of rape by his master. He's thrown into prison. He interprets a dream, and the person he interpreted the dream for forgot to tell the boss that he's innocent, languishing in prison. Yeah, I talk about that pain, pain and suffering. Joseph goes through. What happens though? Through that, not in spite of that, through those circumstances, Joseph is promoted the prime minister of Egypt. He saves the nation by providing for them. And Joseph continues the path to Jesus being born from the nation of Israel. This past week, I read um, the story of Ruth. You haven't read Ruth? Read those four chapters. One of the best stories in the Bible. Here's uh, Ruth is a Moabite, but how does Mo so Moabite get into the story? Oh, yeah, well, Naomi, Ruth's mother-in-law, she has to go to Moab with her husband and two sons because there's a famine 
in Bethlehem where they live. So they go to Moab. That's Gentile country. Leave the promised land, go to Gentile country. They no sooner get there, the husband and two sons die. Now she's a widow in Moab. The two daughters-in-law clinging to her. She, well, I'm going to go back to Bethlehem. One daughter-in-law goes back. Ruth says, well, I'll go with you. They go back. Here's Ruth. They return to poverty-stricken widows. Ruth goes into the field to pick up the scraps left over by the people harvesting. But what happens through that pain and suffering? Ruth becomes the great-grandmother of King David. And Ruth becomes the great-great-great-great-great-great-great-grandmother of Jesus the Messiah. You see, through pain and suffering, God loves to bring about good and his glory. Only God can do that stuff, right? And that's what pain and the context will bring about, can bring about transformation. That's what's happening to Paul. Now, those are all just illustrations of the main story of transformation from Philippians chapter 2. Remember I said everything in Philippians boots off chapter 2. In Philippians chapter 2, what happens? Through Jesus, pain and suffering, we experience forgiveness. His record becomes ours as our record becomes his. We become his brothers and sisters and his inheritance is now given to us. We just recapitulate that story. And God loves to use pain and suffering to bring about transformation. Now, that won't make the pain not hurt anymore. But that different perspective will allow you to deal with the pain in a different way. I don't know what kind of pain and suffering you're dealing with. Maybe it's financial. Maybe it's physical. Maybe it's relational. Maybe it's familial. I don't know what it is. But I do know this. Whatever pain and suffering you're experiencing, Experience it. If Jesus is added to that, transformation is the result. But it doesn't have to be the result. I was reminded of that uh, a couple weeks ago. I spoke for Axe Retirement Communities. They have this big thing once a year where the executives come and the board members come and some, some of the uh, residents come. And every resident I met, every board member... I mean, they were full of joy and happiness. And I'm thinking, oh, this is great, right? I'm going to move in. Um, But as I was driving home, I began to think, you know what? There are a whole lot of other people in the different Acts communities that are not full of joy. You met some of them. Maybe you are some of them. Critical, bitter, resentful, angry. You've met these people? Isn't it interesting? Pain and suffering can bring a warmth and a joy and the result of transformation. But the same pain and suffering in someone else's life can bring a hardness and a bitterness and an anger. And a res- What makes the difference? It, you see, suffering in and of itself doesn't bring about transformation. You need the secret sauce, right? You need the magic ingredient. Oh, here we are back to where we start. What's the dynamic? What's the secret sauce? For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Add Jesus to whatever pain and suffering you're going through. Transformation will be the result. Add the gospel to that. Sit and think that through. Wrestle that from your head to your heart. And it won't make the pain less. Your perspective will change. And as your perspective changes, The Spirit can do the work that only He can do. So I want to end how I started. For to me to live is... Yeah, I hope so. I do know this. You put anything else on that line, here's your destiny. Bitterness, resentment, anger, lack of forgiveness, and a hardness. You fill that line with Jesus, and there'll be transformation. Because you are in Christ, and you have the privilege and responsibility to live out that same message again in your life for the benefit of others.
Now I want to end by, I wasn't going to do this, I'm going to do it anyway. I can't think of a better time for us to think about for me to live as Christ and to die as gain than maybe right now in this country. You want to know why? Because this is an election year. And you know what that means? That means every one of us, regardless of what side of the aisle your sympathies are with, it doesn't matter. You and I are tempted to take something peripheral, something that may, it may be an entailment of the gospel, something that's good, and you're tempted to promote it to the middle. So I made a list of some good things that we may promote to the center. Here, list them. Media bias, abortion, safety and security, heavenly and earthly citizenship, caring for the least of these, economic justice, racial discrimination, law and order. You know what? They're all things that exist. Many of them are good things. Here's what I've discovered in reading a whole lot of this stuff about the polarization of politics and election years. Here's what happens. We often, regardless of your political affiliation, we all want the same thing most of the time. Our disagreements come on how we're going to get there. Everybody wants safety and security. Everybody wants racial, racial um, um, equity. Everybody wants all those things. The difference wrestles, the difference that causes, how are you going to get there? Here's what I want to say. If you take any of those entailments, as good as you may think they are, and you promote that to the place that only Jesus should be on, for me to live is to fight against abortion. For me to live is for racial equality. For me, you know what? You will be divided, we'll be polarized, and we will not be a community. We need to keep Jesus in the center. And if you do that, we can differ on the way to get to some of those destinations, but we can't disagree on what's in the middle. If we agree on that, we will have unity. We will be a community. We can experience comfort. We can experience contentment. And the joy that comes from those things, not because we're getting our way in the entailments, but because Jesus is in the center and he still uses pain and suffering to accomplish his perfect destination. One day we may figure out all the nuances of what this all means. Maybe not. God doesn't promise omniscience to us. But I know this, one day we'll see more clearly. Let's live today thinking of then and how we could live without regret rather than live today, one day looking back and say, I wish I wouldn't have or I wish I would have. How you live today will determine some of that. Let's pray. Father, we give you thanks for, for this little four-chapter book. We thank you for the message that it gives a message of joy that comes through contentment and community, but a message that comes with the gospel as the power plant, as the center. Lord, help us not to take those really familiar verses, wrench them out of their context, and thereby erode them of their power. Help us to keep the gospel front and center, keep Jesus in the middle. And as we do, may we experience contentment, true community, and the joy that comes through the gospel not the joy that comes from the things that we often think will bring it. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.